Um, and let's just jump into it, right? So uh, one of the first things we talked about early on, we talked about fluid statics. And, and one of the major topics that came out of that is pressure change within a column of fluid. So anytime I've got a fluid, right, um, let's say that I've got right, some kind of, I don't know, fluid flow stream or lake or river or anything like that, any kind of fluid, right, so if I've got a surface here exposed to the atmosphere, and fluid, I've got, let's say I've got flowing fluid in here, and I've got flowing fluid going out. So I've got one large pipe here, and I put a, just basically kind of a, a pipe, a little tiny small pipe in within this. And what will happen is the pressure inside here will, will actually push a column of fluid up a little ways. The elevation... And the elevation, how high that column of fluid is, is basically kind of the head. It's the pressure head within that fluid. It's, you're going to have an elevation there, Z. Okay, well, what you have down here is, you, let's say we call this Z1, and you call this Z2, and, and the distance in between them is delta Z, if you will. Right. So the pressure change, the way our text likes to write that is that P2 minus P1 is equal to the density of the flowing fluid times gravity. And your text likes to write it Z1 minus Z2. That's where we're referring to Z as elevation. That means Z is going to increase in the up direction. All right, so let's say I call Z1 0 and Z2 H. Then um, this is, uh, well, that doesn't make sense. I could call either one of these. Um, if I call, yeah, I guess it would. Right? Let's say, um, <clears throat> and I can, <laughs> I've got my whole equation flipped here, right? I, I could write it either way. I could say P1 minus P2 is equal to rho G Z2 minus Z1, and that works. Again, that's saying Z refers to elevation. So if we say, Right. Let's say P2 is equal to 1 atmosphere because it's open to the atmosphere. Uh, let's say Z1, we establish Z1 to be 0 and Z2 to be H, the height of that column of fluid. Again, if, if this is my 0 point, then everything above that is a positive value. And so if I've got the height, right, delta Z is equal to H, right, and let's say if this is 0, this is a positive H because it's above the zero point. And then what happens then is that P1 is equal to one atmosphere plus rho GH in this case. Right? Taking this equation, putting this all together. Okay. Now, there is this concept of a gauge pressure, P gauge. The gauge pressure is what we call the difference between the absolute and the atmospheric pressure. So this would be an absolute pressure here, right? Um, this is the actual pressure right here at point one because the actual absolute pressure at point two is one atmosphere. So that moves over here, so this is one atmosphere. Okay? So the absolute pressure at point one would be this atmosphere here plus the pressure increase to get to this point here. Again, pressure is going to increase as we move down into a column of fluid. As the elevation decreases, pressure will increase. How much does it increase? It increases based on the, the what we call the specific weight of the fluid, density times gravity, and then directly proportional to the elevation change within the fluid. So in this really simple example, the absolute pressure right here at point one is going to be this atmosphere here plus the pressure caused by this column of fluid, rho GH. So P1 is equal to one atmosphere plus rho GH, and P1 gauge is just simply rho G 
pH again in this very simplified scenario. And that's a common scenario to be simplified like this, but anyway, so that's gauge pressure. Okay. Make sure you understand if I put a gauge, right? If I if I were to put a gauge in here, okay, some kind of a pressure gauge. It's going to give me a gauge reading. This pressure gauge here is going to give me this gauge reading. Whatever this calculates out to in PSI or Pascals, that's what my gauge is going to give me. That doesn't mean this, that's the actual pressure within this conduit. The actual pressure is one atmosphere plus the gauge reading. Right? So just be aware of that. Gauges will measure the, a pressure gauge will measure the difference between the pressure outside and the pressure inside. Okay, <clears throat> now let's see, what else here? Um, man, that's, that's kind of the bulk of the stuff from the first exam that we really need to be comfortable with. Um, buoyant force is, is really good and interesting. It's a simplification of this phenomena here. Um, I'm not going to put a buoyant force problem on the exam, or at least not on the final. We saw one on the first exam, and that should be sufficient. Okay. So that leads us then to basically exam two topics. Exam two topics were the conservation principles. Um, we can start with the conservation of mass. So again, for us, our exam two is based off of the three conservation principles, mass, momentum, and energy. So if we start with the conservation of mass, and if we say if we have what we call steady flow, Many texts may call that um, steady state. Um, some texts will call it, especially physics texts, will call this equilibrium. If we reach a point where everything is essentially constant with respect to time, well, what happens then is if we add up all of the mass flow rates coming into our system, and that's going to equal then all of the mass flow rates going out. Again, in our text, a dot above a variable means it's being measured per unit time. Any mass flow rate can be found a number of ways. The typical way we do that is, it's not uncommon we might have a volumetric flow rate. So for us, that's V dot. Again, a lot of texts, they'll use Q, but for us, that's V dot. If I take volume per time and multiply by mass per volume, I get mass per time. Okay. And then um, I can find the volumetric flow rate if I happen to know the cross-sectional area of the conduit and the average speed of the flow through that cross-section. The product of AV gives me V dot. And again, the reciprocal, sometimes if I'm dealing with gases or vapors, I may be dealing with the specific volume, the reciprocal of density. So just make sure you have some way of knowing the difference between speed, volume, and specific volume. Those are all three different quantities. Just have some way of knowing the difference between them. Loud pop. I'm going to check my alignment. Okay, good. I just bumped my desk. I wanted to make sure I didn't mess that up. Okay, so everywhere I've got mass coming into the system, um, I add all that up, and I can set that equal to all the mass going out. If it's like this up here, and I've got one inlet and one outlet, that's easy. Then it's just m.1 is equal to m.2, and, um, well, not 1 and 2. Let's say a and b. So m.a is equal to a m dot b, and there's no reason to distinguish it. It's the same m dot, so we just say that it's, it's the same. It's the same m dot. Right, and we've mentioned for liquids, and a lot of times we'll do with liquids, so uh, if density is constant, right, if density is constant, then V dot is equal to V dot. How do we know that? Well, we know that because if I've got one inlet I've got one outlet, we'll call it one and two, and again we'll just call it M dot. That means that row one A one V one is equal to row two A two V two. And if the density is the constant, as will be the case with liquids, right? Then A V one, A one V one is equal to A V two, A two V two, which means that the volumetric flow rate will be the same in both one and two if the density is constant. Okay. 
Again, you can normally make that assumption with liquids. We've done that throughout the semester, but it's important to understand where that comes from. This is a simplified version of the conservation of mass. Conservation of mass is always true. We didn't get time this semester to talk about compressible flow where the density is not typically constant. When dealing with a gas or a vapor, it's not necessarily a safe assumption that density is constant. If I'm dealing with a liquid, it's a safe assumption most of the time, unless, it's we, unless we're seeing a big temperature change, and I'm not assuming you guys have had thermo or heat transfer yet. In fact, this is most likely a prerequisite for heat transfer. Um, so a big temperature change is what's gonna, what it's gonna take to change the density, and I'm not assuming you've had that yet. So most of the time, if I'm dealing with a liquid, this is true, but this is always true. The total mass flow rate in is gonna equal the total mass flow rate out, so long as we have steady flow. If I've got one inlet, one outlet, that simplifies here. If density is constant, that simplifies there. Okay? All right. That's conservation of mass as we normally would apply it in a simple fluids class. Now, um, let me find myself a little more space here. There we go. This is page one. Page two. Keep myself. I'm going to have probably several pages here, so let's see if I can keep organized. Okay, um, <clears throat> the next concept, and that, so again, exam two topics were the conservation principles, and the, the next conservation principle is essentially conservation of energy, or often we'll call it the general energy equation. I've sometimes heard it referred to as the field equation, the general energy equation. All right, I'm almost at a stopping point there. That's, that's a decent stopping point rather than having to break this video up. So let me stop there. I'll be right back with you guys. Loud pop.